Good morning, good morning, everybody. Have you been enjoying the weather? It's gotten a little bit colder right now, but isn't it fantastic? I want to welcome you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and I invite you all to stand up as we worship him and lift our, song, our hearts and our songs, all to give him glory.
Psalm 34, one through six. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be in my mouth. I praise the Lord. Let the suffering listen and rejoice. Magnify the Lord with me. Together, let us lift his name up high. I sought the, sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to God will shine. Their faces are never ashamed. This suffering person cried out. The Lord listened and saved him from every trouble. This is the word of the Lord. Our Old Testament reading is from Jeremiah. Oh, foggy eyes here. Jeremiah 31, verses 7 through 9. The Lord proclaims, sing joyfully for the people of Jacob. Shout for the leading nation. Raise your voices with praise and call out. The Lord has saved his people, the remaining few in Israel. I'm going to bring them back from the north. I will gather them from the ends of the earth. Among them <clears throat> will be the blind and the disabled, expectant mothers and those in labor. A great throng will return here. With tears of joy, they will come while they pray. I will bring them back. I will lead them by st quiet streams and on smooth paths so they don't stumble. I will be Israel's father. Ephraim will be my oldest child. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to
Say this with me if you would. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Would you join me for a moment in prayer then? Oh, gracious Lord, we thank you for your presence among us today. And truly, what peace floods over us. Speaking last week with someone who visited us for the first time, it was beautiful to hear them talk about the, the presence of struggle in their lives that was kept at, at bay, that when they came into our place of worship together, they felt something different. They sensed your spirit. Lord, it is for us that we should be faithfully religious in pursuing you with everything that's a part of our lives. But Lord, we are not simply gathering together in this space to be able to do religious stuff only. We gather in this space not just simply to talk about what you did a long time ago or how you somehow fulfilled the story of creation in coming and being a redemptive and loving Savior, but that you are here today continuing that story in us. You are seen and evidenced in the ways in which we are allowed uh, to, to step away from having to be the ones in charge and where you are given permission to be able to be truly, by your spirit, the, the gift of love, grace, and mercy in all that we say and do. You, O oh God, are able to guide us and direct us in miraculous ways, and we thank you for that. We celebrate the wonderful ways in which you speak and move among us and continue to meet our needs. And you shape us so that the things that we thought were needs and sometimes really were nothing more than wants, you're able to help us to know how to be able to surrender them to you, that what you give to us is what's necessary. Help us to learn from you today then. Help us to hear your voice. Scripture uses the language of you, Lord, being a great shepherd for us. And the shepherd must be heard by the sheep. And I pray that you would help us to hear your voice, especially when what you're seeking to do is to rescue us and to save us, to help us, especially in times in which we have somehow stepped back in control and we are the ones living as if we were the ones in charge. Help us, O oh God. And during these days, as we watch the leaves fall and the air becomes a bit more crisp, help us to be able to consider the places in which it may feel like there are places and parts of our lives that are diminishing, but may it not be for us the end of all hope. May it be for us the reminder that even in the midst of quiet times, seasons that begin to move towards the, the coldness of winter, that we can know that you, O oh God, are still present, that you are still God, that you are faithful regardless of what might be a part of our past, that you can heal us. That You may not necessarily make the past just all disappear, but that you can take even those moments and bring out of them good. And you can help us in the midst of our journeys to know that you are indeed faithful. Lord, I think of the language of lamentations that draws us to a place of recognizing that even while we are sometimes overwhelmed with the difficulties of life, our mind cannot help but be caught up in all of the, the difficulties and disappointments. But then even, even then, every single morning, we are given an opportunity to be able to renew our memory of you and to know that you have been faithful. 
and that your faithfulness is great indeed. It is new every single morning, every single day. And we give you thanks and praise. Oh, what a beautiful gift it was today to meet a new brother in Christ and to hear him talk about our connectedness. Wondering as I talked to him if maybe we had met each other. He looked very familiar. And I, I love that moment where he said to me today that, that what a privilege it is for us to be able to, to know that because we, we happen to come from the same family. We are your children. And I pray, oh God, that you would help us then to consider what it means to be partners then in your family, building your kingdom in all that we say and do, proclaiming your good news in the ways in which we know peace, but also share it that the world might become even more so a sanctuary by which people will be rescued and redeemed from all kinds of brokenness. May today be a day in which you are worshipped and adored. And not just from our lips, not just somewhere deep within our minds, but from every part of our being. May this moment be for us, even as we come to your table, an opportunity that we as your church might be able to celebrate with everything we are, the fullness of raising the banner high and declaring that we are yours, that you might again take us, that you might again bless us, that you might break us and give us, that the world would know the story of what it means to be adopted by you, to be your children, to be a part of your family, to know you truly as Abba, Father. Oh, Lord, we give you thanks and we give you praise. We rest in you in Jesus' name, in the precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. As I invite Pastor Marcos and those that will be sharing with us in the leadership of communion today, I want to invite you to listen for a few moments as we share the words that the apostle shares with us in regards to this wonderful meal. We find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 as he says this, I received a tradition from the Lord, which I also handed on to you. On the night in which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. After giving thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this to remember me. He did the same thing with the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Every time you drink it, do this to remember me. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you broadcast the death of the Lord until he comes. In the tradition of the church, this was a significant moment for them, especially in Corinth, as they were understanding and knowing what it meant to be a part of God's story. I've had some fun debates with sacramentalists over this subject, in the idea that there is a place in which in this moment we should be doing what is the tradition of those who, as the early Christians, did their faith in Christ. And I've said there's also a place in which we have to let the meaning of that soak over us. To stop for even a moment in this journey and to recognize that this is not simply a tradition that Paul received and passed on, but it is also a way of living by which you and I are able to recognize our participation in something that is bigger than us. In fact, quite mystically, it seems strange to think about it. We gather together in this meal with those who've gone before us, who they themselves declared faith in Jesus Christ. That's significant. That's a big deal. I was talking with a family member who was having a birthday recently, and I was saying, you know, if you think back to where you were, say, in the year, and we named a year, and I said, that was the year that your parent was the same age that you are today. I kind of went, oh, yeah, I didn't think about that. If we consider this meal being not just simply something that we are doing in 2021, but that we are joining together with those who've gone before us, there is indeed for us a cloud of witnesses who join together with us to encourage us to help us to know that whatever fights that we fight in faith, they're not simply driven by culture around us or the lack of faith that exists in the culture around us, but they're driven by a people for generations who have believed that Jesus has been faithful and God will continue to remain faithful and interested in our place in the journey that we might be able to be Christ's witnesses in all that we say and do. I talked to a pastor recently who said, well, we've had a smaller group of people attending church these days due to COVID. And while we might be able to talk about the two or three gathered here using Jesus' language, the reality is, is that we number many, many more. Just yesterday, I was enjoying a chance to go for a little ride with my wife, enjoying one last little fun day out in the sun in my little convertible. And it was cold by the time we got back. It was the last ride for sure. But one of the things I was telling my Sunday school class that we did while we were doing that event was we stopped at a place uh, way out in the middle of Hollis that, that had this beautiful meal presented that was just so exciting to me. It was Jamaican jerk chicken. Oh, I love Jamaican jerk chicken. 
And I was remembering, I was telling my essential class how much it made me remember the times in which Pauline Rangulon had given to me that gift. She would bring it to me wrapped in foil and I would get this beautiful meal. It was so much fun. And I was thinking this morning as I was getting ready for the service about those like Pauline, so many others in our lives. Somebody was sharing with me some stories this week about Bessie. Those that have gone on before us who while we might feel so disconnected, certainly in times in which we grieve their loss, we recognize that they themselves had loved and lived for Christ. And we have the opportunity to join with them, even in a moment like this, to be able to share in the tradition of those who remember that Christ has taken us, that Christ is blessing us, and that Christ is wishing to break us and give us, that the world even yet today would know the truth of Jesus Christ. One of my relatives asked me yesterday on the phone, he said, John, do, do you think these are the last days? I said, you know, there's always a lot of evidence that would make it feel like that. But I said, could it be that that is somewhat irrelevant to us in that we recognize that today is the day the Lord has made. This is the opportunity by which if it is the last day that we can then be broken and given for the sake of Jesus Christ, the world might know. Well, we have an opportunity to do that. Not just to tell the story of a Jesus who made the way for us to live differently in this world, but who by his spirit, even in these moments, allows us, us to become the flesh and blood of Christ that we might share the good news with those around us. I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of what Jesus is doing today. And while this might simply be symbolic of that commitment and call, I can only begin to imagine what will happen that the world might know the peace of Christ as you and I say, Lord, live through me. I'm going to ask the servers if they would to prepare and take their place around the sanctuary to serve us. And as they do so, I would invite you to consider that call personally as I would also invite you to consider that as you pray collectively for all of us in this faith family that the Lord might use us to be a witness in Christ's community in this place and around the globe. And I don't simply say that just to hope that we can kind of be motivated as if I was a motivational speaker just to be a little bit nicer when we drive down the road. I'm, I'm praying for God to use us to transform this world in which we live. I have high hopes, certainly optimistic in these moments, but I believe the Lord is faithful, more than able to do anything beyond anything we could ever ask or imagine as we say yes to Jesus. As we get ready for that time together, would you join me for a moment in prayer? And I want to give you a couple of instructions just to, before we also take that moment in prayer. And that is simply that we would invite you to come and to share in this meal. And for those of you that are new with us today, you don't have to be a member of our church or as we call it, an owner of our church in this place and the mission of Christ. We simply ask that you're able to declare Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And to join us simply in the humility of knowing that you need Jesus. This is our moment of confession. Even if you don't know what all that means, and this is the moment where you're saying, Lord, I come before you, come. As you do so, it may be that today is the moment as well that you need to confess some sins. Even if you have prayed that in years past, this is an opportunity to do that. Just simply before the Lord, quietly in your mind, maybe asking for a sister or brother even to help you in prayer. To stop for a moment and to ask the Lord to forgive you and to guide you and to enable you to be who Christ has called you to be. We're using during COVID season here elements that are in a prepackaged container. And so to access the bread, you'll need to peel back the cellophane layer. To access the, the wine, you'll need to be able to peel back the foil layer. And just so you know, we use unfermented wine as uh, we stand in solidarity with those for whom alcohol is an issue. And we also do serve gluten-free bread. I'll be serving that if you need to receive that. Just get my attention. And I'll be walking around as well with a tray to serve those who are not able to make their way to one of the servers. So let's pray together as we go to that meal. Oh, gracious Lord, thank you so much for your presence among us today. I ask, oh Lord, that you'd help us all to share that same confession today. That as we share in this meal, we would be able to know that you are faithful and able. That this would not simply be for us a nod to a, a religious practice, that we just do it because we do it each week. But that this would be a moment in which we are at least getting a chance to say to you, Lord, we will live for you and serve you. Even if we might think that the bread and juice tastes funny, that this is a strange moment, this is an odd occasion. May this be the opportunity in which those things become secondary to our yes to you in whatever way is necessary. And for those that are not able to join with us here in person, I pray, O oh Lord, that you would help them to still know communion with us. 
as I've been praying for those who will join us through our live stream today, I've been thinking about this piece being an element that is missed. And I pray, O oh Lord, that you'd help those that join us in this way to be able to find a way in their lives to sense and to know communion. Your desire is for us all to eventually be able to be connected to a community of faith. This is not the season in which it becomes necessarily uh, okay to be able to be disconnected and individual and lone Christians. None of us can do that. It's not healthy, nor is it helpful to us. As I pray for all of us to find our connection to you, may it be, Lord, that it's not just about us doing a work to somehow make it through or to push through this season, but may you take us as you see fit, even if it means that we may stay separated for still yet some more time and through even uh, the realities of work and travel and all of that. But may you bless us and may, us, may you help us wherever we are to be broken and given for the sake of your good news in this world. To you be all the glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. My dear friends, when you're ready, would you come and share in this meal? What a beautiful, beautiful song. Thank you, Janice. What a reminder. There's no turning back. We say yes and we commit to live for Christ. The body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which was broken for us. The, body, the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which was shed for us. May it preserve us blameless into abundant and everlasting life. By the grace of God, may we continue to live and let Christ live in and through us. To God be the glory. Would you stand? Let's lift our voices together in song once again.
You may be seated, and we dismiss our children now to their time of children's worship to head on out with Miss Emily. Wonderful. What a beautiful song and worship team. Way to go. I, I, I did notice one little piece of it. I noticed you had to ask Rick to be the one to dance and to lead us in that. And thank God he didn't. No, I'm just kidding. We celebrate the presence of Christ. And that song sings to us about what it means to be a collective people gathering in praise. As if somehow we had joined in a line to celebrate and to move through the room and celebrate this, this rush of God's presence that guides us and gives us hope and peace. To God be the glory. Well, I tease Rick, but uh, it's only fair because he's going to tease me in a moment in a video you're going to watch. Because I've asked Rick to share with us a little bit about what it means to include others in the journey as we talk about leaving before God, consecrating before God our lives, setting in the Lord's hands who we are as the people of God. So would you watch for a moment as Rick shares with us. Good morning, LFC. I'm reading what I had to say so that I don't forget anything. And I chose my words very carefully to fit around three minutes for Pastor John's sake. As long as I can remember, I've loved books or movies that have a theme of partnership. Robin Hood and His Merry Men, The Hardy Boys, Stanley and Livingston, The Three Musketeers, The Stories of David and Jonathan, David and His Fellow Warriors, The Goonies, Partnerships in Tom Clancy and John Grisham novels, real-life missionary accounts like Nate Saint and Jim Elliott and their wives, where partnership is the key to accomplishing goals, Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Timothy, and too many others to mention. At the same time, I confess I'm a slow learner in practicing partnership. I have often thought I know the answer, the direction, or the priorities that are needed at the moment. I realize more and more nowadays the answers I don't have, the directions I don't know, and the priorities I have to realign. I've been deeply involved in seven churches and organizations, worked for eight to ten companies, directed church choirs, and assorted smaller musical groups during the past 50 plus years. Here at LFC, I've been learning the value of partnership more and more over the past 15 years. My music friends here have been especially instrumental in opening my eyes to this. They've helped me realize I don't have to know all the answers when I have so many partners available to me. Amen. Sharon and I have been married for 48 years and known each other for 53 years. During the last four years of shared retirement, including two cross-country camper trips that had us living in a 15-foot camper for one to five months at a time, family crises around birth and cancer and our own medical challenges. The reality of a for richer or poorer in sickness and in health partnership have become richer and fuller. The joy of being fully inclusive partners on our path together has increased more and more. The value of my best friend and life partner has risen far more than any investment I've ever had. Sharon and I are finding more and more joy of partnership with our children as we all mature and learn about life together. And I'm aware our children realized I didn't have all the answers before I became acutely aware of my lack of answers. My perspective on being included has also been shaped by my adoption story. Adoption is a powerful inclusion decision. I've learned about obstacles my adoptive parents faced in the path from fostering me to adopting me. The reunion with my mother's daughters and their family shapes my thoughts about the value of inclusion. The connection with daughters of my biological father shapes my feelings about inclusion. The failure to have a successful connection with my father's son has taught me about the loss of inclusion. The loss of inclusion at churches we've been a part of in the past has also taught us about the potential of power and of pain that lies within the church family. Our current involvement in Life Group is an intentional effort to build more partnership in our LSA family. It was in Life Group recently that I was hit with a powerful reminder of spiritual partnership in Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, 21 through 23 focused my attention on all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, all are yours. This reminded me that the inclusion that may be forsaken or fractured here cannot be forsaken or fractured in the eternal kingdom of God. So our losses are temporary, even though powerfully painful. To know one another, trust one another is just another road of partnership that's available here. There's more joy to discover in all the families we're members of if we include others on the path we're walking.
Wonderful. Well said, Rick. Thank you so much for that. What a powerful word on the beauty of collaboration and inclusion. And on behalf of the viewers at home, thanks for keeping it around three minutes. I appreciate that. Thanks, brother. You know you've been somewhere for quite a while when an instruction like that becomes a common thread. I know you've heard it all along this month about, well, maybe it's an easy chance to get rid of the nerves, I suppose, is this poor pastor is simply inviting people to collaborate logistically in service leadership with someone, and they got to mention the three minutes again. I know, actually, when you say it that way, that I'm trying to collaborate logistically over service leadership, it sounds like I deserve every bit of that. I suppose that's a part about being the family, isn't it, together? Well, seriously, it does make me chuckle, and strangely, it fits right in with our passage today. I believe there's something powerful to be said to us about life these days and these messages that we've been sharing through Mark's gospel. Now, before we read our text for today, let me collect us in remembering our previous travels with the disciples who have relegated Jesus to a position under the bus, at least in comparison to where Jesus should be in their attention and worship. Just so they could be sure they could worship miracle dreams of them getting a prime seat in the kingdom of God. As you may well remember, we've traveled with those disciples in Mark's Gospels on the way to Jerusalem through those disciples' aspirations, self-help by the miraculous, and posturing in hope before the Lord. But through Jesus' compassion and, and yet very serious prophetic vision of their future and even saying yes to the call, let alone desiring places of prominence in the kingdom, we've heard that there is something to be said about our place in support of others. Or should I say, our place of peace when we are first or even last. And so beautifully, Mark shares Jesus' ministry story here with us again today, sending home the value of mercy that can indeed save us, even if we ourselves feel blinded and left by the side of the road. The metaphor in this text will be the blind character who finds the healing work of God. I love the language, Rick, that you used in your video that references the, the investments that have paid out beyond the dividends that you would see financially otherwise. That we might be a people who together understand that collaboration and inclusion is something that's going to be much more beneficial to all of us along the way. We often feel like others' problems, their loud shouts, as we're going to see in this text, overpower our own pursuit of salvation. Because no matter how much our issue compares with another's, it certainly is relative. It's the the issue that we know, and we know what it will take for God to save us. We know what we need. But today I wonder if we might hear where mercy might save not just us as individuals, but might save us all. So look with me, if you would, at Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, as we look at verses 46 through 52. And I'm going to ask you, if you're able to, to stand with us in honor of God's Word as we look at this text together. Those of you that are not with Bible today in your hands, I would invite you to check out your uh, smartphone app for our church, Church Scribe, and it has the scriptures already linked in our weekly bulletin. And so check that out. It's a great place to be able to find out information about what's happening. In fact, there's some activities happening following our service today, as well as activities that are happening through the week. But there's also connections to our service here in this place. You can share some of the messages, etc., and be able to share in the text that's here. It starts out this way. Jesus and his followers came into Jericho. As Jesus was leaving Jericho, together with his disciples and a sizable crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, Timaeus' son, was sitting beside the road. When he heard that Jesus of Nazareth was there, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, show me mercy. Many scolded him, telling him to be quiet, but he shouted even louder, son of David, show me mercy. And Jesus stopped and said, call him forward. They called the blind man, be encouraged, get up, he's calling you. Throwing his coat to their side, he jumped up and came to Jesus. Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said, teacher, I want to see. Jesus said, go, your faith has healed you. At once he was able to see, and he began to follow Jesus on the way. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. So they were on their way to Jerusalem. But here they're on their way to Jericho. 
Like the walls that once fell there, the disciples' experience in Jericho is really quite short-lived. In fact, if you go back to verse 46, it has them coming into Jericho, and then it has them leaving Jericho within the same only five words. The difference is that they came in as a group of followers, but now they are a group of disciples and a sizable crowd on their way out of town. Mark doesn't give us the image of their desperation for Jesus that causes them to walk even out of town with him, but it must have been something very important. He was coming through fairly quickly, and for these people, in the midst of what seemed like a very short stay, we can only begin to understand that they were still very hungry to express their need for salvation. They hadn't had all their needs met. They needed Jesus in some very personal and still yet very real ways. Surely more mercy was needed by each and every person in that sizable crowd. We can only imagine what they might be praying for, let alone among the disciples themselves, who by our passage last week has revealed that their following was not just to be 100% in service to God's kingdom, but in hopes that maybe, just maybe, God's kingdom could also change their future for the better. Well, that's where we then find this crowd and those disciples gathered together. It's where we find this friend of Jesus, dare I say Jesus' buddy, Bart, if you will, sitting by the side of the road as a blind beggar. In a culture where commodities were not necessarily monetary, but service and supply-oriented, his need was obvious. Not to mention that he had some internal needs inside of himself, for as he struggled as a man begging by the side of the road, hoping to be able to get the scraps of people's service and supply, he was also known as the son of Timaeus. That is significant. A man whose name means highly prized. And here he was, wondering daily if there was anything to be prized about his experience in life. To be the son of such a man, the need of Bard is glaringly obvious and obviously painful. Surely not something himself treasured, but something he wished to discard and change. And he hears that Jesus is coming his way. In fact, I find it a a serious notation from Mark that here Bart hears that Jesus of Nazareth is coming his way. Some of you may remember this, some of you know this about our church, as we call ourselves Nazarenes as well. But do you know what it meant for Jesus to be a Nazarene? He had the same potential of being an ironic gift that was essentially worthless too, just like the son of Timaeus. Mark understood that in his own personal life, especially being one of the societal losers himself, even if his marginalization is not because of poverty of wallet, but assumed poverty of soul, at least in the mind of everyone cheated by a tax collector. He understands who this Jesus is and how he received him himself and the other sinners at his home not so long ago. Here Mark tells us that Bard is hungry for that kind of salvation as well. In fact, he starts yelling for Jesus to show him mercy. Did you hear how he worded that cry? Jesus, son of David, Show me mercy. I find it rather amazing that the son of the highly prized one is calling out to the son of the favorite one. That's what David means. Interesting fact that he would choose those words and Mark would recall it in this way. Bard is hoping to find salvation and one who's better than gold mercy might just change everything. And so he shouts it out to one who may understand his need better than anyone else. Say it with me. Try it with me for a few moments. Jesus, son of David, show me mercy. Say it nice and loud with me. Jesus, son of David, show me mercy. One more time. Jesus, son of David, show me mercy. What's wrong with you people? Why do you talk so loud when you say that? What's your problem? Well, I'm totally kidding, but... I mean, can you begin to start to even feel the shame? Like, especially those of you that are introverts and you were like, I don't really want to do this. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. We don't need to do this. And the moment I say, what's wrong with you? You're like, well, see, that's exactly what I'm talking about. I shouldn't have said this. I didn't need to be a part of this. This is the place where we find the crowd standing over Bart and saying, what's wrong with you? Would you please stop it? Now, I wonder, though, we have to wrestle with why in the world they would even begin to place that shame on him. Do you think 
that it's really because they have concern that Jesus will have a peaceful exit from Jericho? I don't think so. Or could it be because this man's shouts drown out their own cries for salvation? All he wanted was to have his namesake hope, that that is, as the son of Timaeus, connect with the very prized presence of God to meet his personal struggle. But that may also be what they wanted too. I, I mean, as much as we are aware of need in our community, we also can say that we have need, don't we? I mean, that's why we seek Christ's mercy, that hope would not just heal a few of us, but would heal all of us, that it would heal the place in which we find ourselves. The text says that Mark has Jesus stopping when he hears this. But Jesus doesn't just make a personal choice to offer mercy to Bart. He doesn't turn to him directly and say, well, let me fix your problem here. He instead changes the community's response by inviting them to be collaborative and inclusive by joining in mercy themselves. Where they once were hearing Bartimaeus is drowning out their own need for mercy to save them, they are given the opportunity to find their healing as a people even more deeply as Jesus gives the power of this radical change over to the community. The moment of systemic change for this town where the walls of hope really get built up again comes when Jesus hears Bartimaeus and says to the whole lot of them, especially those that scolded this blind brother, you call him forward. He's talking to the whole crowd. You call them, call him forward. Now, I know there's a difference between this being the moment in which we see this as the place in which he was then healed and the moment in which he comes to the healer. But it reminds me of that moment in which Jesus being beginning to speak to the disciples about the resurrection of life when he comes to the tomb where Lazarus has been buried and he says to Lazarus, come out. That's not just about Lazarus' story. He has just spoken to Mary and Martha about the need to be able to see him as the resurrection and the life. What's happening to Lazarus is happening to everybody. And I think the same thing's happening here. I mean, this was significant enough that those who just moments ago scolded Bartimaeus as their crowding around Jesus was hampered by his shouts, now they shout words of encouragement. Did you hear those words? Be encouraged, they said. Get up. He's calling you. What a difference. What a change in such a community of faith. One that scolds and looks out at those around us who are bothering us and instead looks at that one and says, be encouraged. Get up. Jesus is calling you. My friends, I wept this week as I considered this message. Because I couldn't help but imagine what might happen if the church of Jesus Christ would spend less time scolding the world for the noise that it makes as we try to get close to Jesus. For us to stop spending our energies demanding the world treats us better. For us to begin living good news to the world around us with that very same message. Be encouraged. Get up. He's calling you. I had the privilege of watching Rick's video earlier in the week as I was preparing for this service, and so those tears turned to tears of joy. As I began to imagine the same world that he testified to where the mercy that saves us is not just what comes from our lips and hands, but it's an invitation for mercy to save us all. My friends, I'm telling you, I think Bartimaeus was most most likely already healed even in some ways before Jesus even spoke to him. If you look at the text, it says that Jesus did restore his sight. But the healing of becoming once again somebody, a highly prized son of one who was also highly prized, that heals more than we could ever imagine. Simply being included and being recognized is huge. I mean, did you notice it here? This guy was on the outside of the crowd. He was away from Jesus. And after he was able to hear them invite him to the encouragement, the calling to come to Jesus, he jumps up, it says, and he comes to Jesus. How? You can't see yet, right? I mean, I get goosebumps thinking of this very moment. He couldn't see, but the crowd helps him make his way to Jesus. 
he finds Jesus and is healed. That, my friends, is the kind of healing ministry I want to be a part of. We may not be able to be the ones who have the flash come out of our hands, but if we can help people find Jesus, oh my goodness, what could happen in the world in which we live? My friends, I'll even go out on a limb here and say that we have much work to do to continue through our collective Christian understanding of God's desire for our lives in terms of our lifestyle choices, the way in which we live Christian lives day in and day out the rest of the week. And you can pick any sort of reference in which that works for you as a family person, as you work at work, in your neighborhood, etc. But hear Mark's recalling of this gospel story as it says that we will all find mercy that saves us when we stop scolding the world and we begin to believe that they are indeed important to Jesus. I had you repeat it with me, and I must admit I was not very kind. I used it to tease you, but I'm going to ask you to say these words with me again, this time being the next message. Be encouraged. Say that with me. Get up. Jesus is calling you. Could you imagine if that was the message of this church in this community? Mark is letting us know that those who have known mercy have the power to share Jesus in ways that can really make a difference, that can really heal. Jesus certainly asked the question of Bart, a question that I believe Jesus asks you today. He says to him and he says to you today, what do you want me to do for you? Hear that. That needs to be a part of your personal devotional life with Jesus. You need to hear this Jesus speak those words to you. Not that you might just bring out your list and begin to start telling all the things that you want. This week in the church office, for some reason, we received a catalog of toys. I'm not sure why they came to the church office, but I was still looking through the catalog, you know, checking it out. And I was telling Brian how when I was a kid, when my mother would give me the catalog and try to help me to pick out a, a gift or two, I got to a point where I started circling page numbers. I was trying to be real smart in the whole thing. It's not for us to come before Jesus to hear him say that. What do you want me to do for you? That we might then just say, Jesus, I want this and I want that. But Jesus is really and authentically interested in your need. You need to know that. No matter what you are crying out for in the middle of the night, no matter what struggle you keep finding yourself running back and forth to, whether it's addictive or whether it's a constant issue of a relationship that's broken or fears or doubts, whatever it might be, you need to hear Jesus say to you, what do you want me to do for you? But you and I also need to hear Jesus ask the crowd a similar question. One that this rabbi, who Bart later calls him teacher, has somehow now taught the crowd in their transition from the place in which they were making sure their personal needs were met to the place in which they became then the people who followed after God's will. As I think God would say to us as well, what mercy then can I show you when you help others see me? We spend a lot of time in our world making sure that we can articulate very clearly how we feel like we are the victims in a world that is trying to push us into a small little corner, into a place where our world is broken and consistently hampered as religious uh, liberties continue to be changed and fought against. But I believe the opportunity is not for us simply to stand in this world constantly with our fists up in the air. But I believe the Lord is inviting us to hear the words that really were spoken throughout all of the biblical story to a people that were invited not just to be blessed, but to be a blessing. That together we might recognize hope. That we have seen Jesus and that we have a beautiful privilege of finding even more fulfillment and even more mercy that saves us as we include others in that story of God's grace. I love the imagery that was in this text here. It's a little side note, but it's, it's quite interesting to note that we remember that post-resurrection story, if you will, of, of how when Jesus was on the beach and the disciples recognized that he was there, the, the text tells us that Peter takes, out, take off, takes off his outer coat and dives into the water and tries to make his way before everyone back to Jesus. I love the imagery here of, of Bart, who does a very similar thing. Did you notice that? He takes off his coat and he makes his way to Jesus. Now again, he still is not healed, but it shows to us, and I think Mark was very intentional in saying this, that it shows a radical transformation in Bart's life. 
simply because the people of God acted like they were. It was evidence that the Spirit had indeed awakened them and was rising up in that river that we just sang about earlier today that flows not just for us, but with us and through us in all that we say and do. Oh, my Christian friends, oh, my church family, what might awaken in all of us today if we were to become such a people? Ones that discovered and found God's faithfulness in our lives when we become truly the priesthood of believers who have a message of mercy. Now, now, now be careful with me. We need to remember where that gets framed in our culture. It is certainly bigger than acceptance as mercy still required repentance in each of our lives to make us this people. This is still inclusion to even have to deal with places of such repentance but that with the message of hope in our lives, we start seeing people see Jesus. Can you imagine what would happen if we as a church were to see on a regular basis, not just in the collection of our services here, but in our daily lives lived out in this world, if we were to see people become saved once again on a regular basis? Oh God, please. Oh my friends, that may be the moment that Jesus says to this crowd, in this city, in all of Lowell's churches, that we are also healed as the world finally sees Jesus. Can you imagine? Would you pray with me? Oh God, I feel that imagination brewing among this collaborative group that you've called the church a people passionate about seeking your kingdom, saying not just the words, may your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven, but knowing that you do meet our need for daily bread. But Lord, it is not just enough that we should keep pushing and elbowing our way to the front of the crowd that we might get our need met, even though it seems, Lord, sometimes like as fast as you went through Jericho, you move through our lives sometimes even more quickly and more quietly, and we struggle hearing even the story of Elijah in the Bible that, that says that you were, you were heard only even in the simple and still small voice. Sometimes we can't even hear that. And sometimes we struggle to be able to feel as if our prayers lifted off and somehow made their way to you. But Lord, the answer is not for us then as your church to keep telling the world to be quiet so that we can tell you more and more. In fact, Lord, sometimes the way in which we find you is when we go to the places in which you are speaking and whispering in the ears and in the hearts and the lives of those who do not see you, do not know that you are there. And I pray, O oh God, that you would help us to realize that your mercy will not just save those people, but it will save all of us. It will transform the world in which we live if we, your church, would be truly yours. Lord, help us. Help us to have a message that includes encouragement to get up, to rise from our place of brokenness, our places of being stuck, our places in which we have tried to live as the king of all. And many of us in our lives have found that it never worked. It never succeeded. But instead, may we come to you that you may become our Lord and Savior and that you, O oh God, may be able to be that which rescues and redeems us by your great grace and mercy. Not just receiving us and somehow putting a stamp of okayness on that which is spoiled or broken or frustrated or not in any way close to your desire for humanity, but that we might not be the ones who start out with judgment, that in fact judgment may not even be the thing that you lead out with, but that your mercy would continue to bring us to a place of recognizing our deep need for you and that it might change lives in very practical and real ways. O oh God, we humbly ask in Jesus' name that this may be true and so in us. And so we say, amen. Amen. My dear friends, would you stand? Let's lift our voices together in song.
receive then our benediction today. May our need find healing in the loving mercy of God lived and loved through us as Christ's church. To God be the glory. Go in Christ's peace.